I want to introduce this morning Morgan um, Wills. Morgan is president and CEO for the next week, About eight days, eight days of, of Siloam Health up in Nashville. Siloam is a terrific organization that helps people who do not, it's a medical organization who helps people who do not have medical insurance. I went to a fundraiser for uh, Siloam last fall, and the thing that impressed me was how many people who got up and were telling their experience of having been to Siloam saying, I feel cared for, I feel loved, I feel safe here. And there's not always places where you can feel safe. Any corporate culture comes from the top, from the CEO and president. And I won't attribute it all to Morgan, but he's responsible for the spirit, for the corporate culture, if you will, of Siloam. And so I'm really glad to have him here. I've been fascinated with Morgan um, because of all he's done there. My wife volunteered at Siloam. Morgan comes from a um, family that has given a lot to Nashville. Uh, his father is a historian who has written 28 books on the history of Nashville. 32, Larry. 32? Okay. <laughs> just, just published his last one. Still writing. At age 89. <laughs> That's, one of the great things about being an editor or writer is y you don't have to stop. And his mother uh, was helped to start and inspire Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Is that right? Yes. And my first question is, with a heritage like that, um, how did that affect you as a young man, as a teenager? Um, did it inspire you? Did it, how did you feel? All right. So I guess we're going. Uh, we're starting. So I told Larry, first of all, it's great to be back at Puckett's. Um, yeah, I had to you know, pass the border and show my visa coming down from Davidson County this morning. Um, but um, you know, I, I told Larry I would be w happy to come, but the busyness of this season was such that I would come if he put the cookies on the low shelf. So interview me and don't make me prepare a talk. So thank you, Larry, for indulging me and, and letting him stay on stage like this. So. Um, so the heritage of my parents, how that impacted me, how it influenced me. Um, as he mentioned, I'm a ninth generation Nashvilleian. Um, you know, both my, my parents have lived not just in Davidson County, they spent 15 years towards the end of the later part of their lives at um, Meeting of the Waters on Del Rio Pike up here. So we're also connected in, in, uh, to the Williamson County Franklin area pretty deeply. Um, but yeah, I grew up in the air of our family was um, was giving back, being a part of the community you're from, investing, um, and I don't think I really appreciated how um, unusual that was or how um, uh, significant what my, my parents and, you know, my mom's involvement in the children's hospital was born out of losing her son, her two and a half year old son, to a heart defect uh, three months before I was born. Um, so I, that, that sense of loss, you know, was channeled into championing a, a, a first-class uh, pediatric cardiology program and the hospital to support it here in Nashville. And I think my dad's uh, giving to the community in, in a variety of ways through the YMCA, United Way, um, many other organizations, the Land Trust for Tennessee he's been very involved with, um, grows from um, that sense of um, you know, stewardship, you know, to whom much has been given, much is expected. So uh, I could talk a lot more about them, but it, it was just kind of the air I breathed. Do you, I didn't tell you I was going to ask this question, do you see that same sense in your children? I hope so. It's, it's a loaded uh, yeah. question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have emerging adults, uh, 19, 21, 22, and um, you know, that we're, we're so uh, grateful for the the, the, the kind of calling and the sense of emerging passions in them, but you know, all bets are off. They're out there, you know, sowing their uh, energies, passions into things that they're hopeful about. And I, I trust over time, mm -hmm. God will steer that in ways that uh, really bless the communities that they sink their teeth into. And I hope um, many, if not most of them, will come back here. My parents hit the lot, won the lottery, but all three of the boys came and, and lived and, and spent their lives here in Nashville. And my brother, I should say, my younger brother, is actually the founder of the 
co-founder of the Contributor newspaper, the homeless newspaper in Nashville that I think has been present in Williamson County as well. Wow, cool. My wife tells a story of being uh, with another, uh, volunteering at another organization up in Nashville, and when they found out she was a nurse, they said, what are you doing here? You need to be over at Siloam. And so she went over, and at the time, Siloam was just in a small apartment. So could you tell us a little bit about when and how Siloam started and how you got involved? Because you weren't there yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, so at the very beginning, um, it really, it was a ministry that grew out of the early days of Belmont Church um, on Music Row. Um, and as that renewal was percolating through the city of Nashville and the, really across the country, uh, but that had been one of the epicenters for it. Uh, there were some uh, medical professionals in the congregation when it was meeting at West End Junior High School on West End before they even had a building. And they were passing notes, and one of them in particular, Dr. David Gregory, uh, who was there uh, at the time, passed a note to some other medical professionals there and, and just wondering what, how could we take and steward what we're experiencing on Sunday to Monday? Um, and how could this you know, affect the brokenness that we're experiencing? And he saw firsthand going to General Hospital, seeing a cycle of uh, uninsured patients coming through an emergency room, getting patched up, getting a temporary fix, you know, coming back a month or two later, when the real social, emotional, and even spiritual forces that were driving it were never being addressed. And so it was out of that vision of the kingdom of God breaking into Monday through the professional, through the work life, that Salome was born. And so it was really an outreach to the, the area around the church uh, new building uh, on Music Row. So the Edge Hill community was the, uh, the place where your wife volunteered in the early days. And mm -hmm. um, they spent two years canvassing, kind of doing a needs assessment, really trying to make this a grassroots um, effort that met the needs of the community. And um, it started in 19, opened the doors in 1991 um, and operated as a volunteer clinic for the better part of that decade uh, before I was brought on as the first staff physician in 2000. How do you find out about Siloam? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> short answer is I was a medical student looking for outlets to, to practice, to, to learn from senior uh, physicians, uh, to get you know not out of the books and into patients' lives. But my backstory really affected that because after college, um, you know, I've been a in Nashville, I went away to, to university. I met people at college that had spent time overseas um, for shorter or longer periods of time and kind of a hunger was ignited in me to do something similar. And so I took a backpack and headed east uh, around the world after graduating from college and uh, took a year uh, and spent three months of that time in a small community in West Africa in Ghana. Um, and it was through a relationship that my father and mother had with an an African man who had come to our church at downtown Presbyterian Church and had a dream to go back and be a physician in Ghana. Um, and um, I wasn't a pre-medical student at the time, but I, I was looking for a volunteer base and I had a relationship and little did I know, you know, what I was getting into, uh, but I was kind of ambushed by Jesus there. Um, so growing up in the church, you know, background music of my heart and mine, um, but really not uh, in a personal, you know, committed, discipling way, following the Lord, uh, really encountered a community that took the words of Scripture very seriously. Felt like I was living off the pages of Scripture while I was there, and uh, and really captured my heart. You know, seeing the change, the tr the miracles, the transformation in hearts, minds, and community, uh, and and then and then tr continuing my trip around the world and meeting people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who had experienced the same gift of life uh, in Christ. And um, so that had ruined me for, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> business as usual, healthcare as usual. I wanted to see other ways of doing healthcare than just the conventional uh, path. And so that was my chasing down Dr. Gregory for an opportunity to volunteer, mm -hmm. not just to serve and develop skills, but to, to get a vision for what a, a Christ-centered practice of medicine might look like. Huh. So what makes Siloam different? Well, that's, that's the biggest part right there. I mean, our mission is to share the love of Christ by serving those in need through health care. And if you look at that sentence, health care is at the end, and it's part of a preposition, through health care. So we want to do excellent health care. We want to take the best training that I and others have received at Vanderbilt and other uh, institutions. Uh, but 
but let it be a vehicle. It's so easy for good things to become the all important things. That's sort of the dynamic of idolatry, right? We, we take good things, we, we try and squeeze more out of them than they can give us. And when God helps us reorder those loves, um, all of a sudden there's a beautiful path for his, his glory, his, his love to flow through. And so I say that's the key thing that sets us apart. But if you walked in, the thing that you would probably notice first is this, this looks like heaven uh, in the sense that um, 90% of the p patients are from other countries. Um, it's kind of like the world, right? In the United States, it's probably less than 10% of world population. <laughs> uh, we, but when you walk in Salome, uh, that you experience the global reality uh, every day um, in a way that we never planned. It wasn't intended early on. But Salom stumbled onto a population of Vietnamese uh, refugees in the early days who were falling through the cracks of the healthcare system. And really, just by word of mouth through that community, uh, built a reputation where immigrants and refugees started coming in droves. So, we've overseen a refugee medical screening program for the state of Tennessee for two decades now. Uh, all new refugees coming to Middle Tennessee will be screened. Uh, at Salom, but uh, we still see patients born and raised here, but just the, the reputation and niche has become those who struggle with culture and language barriers to access healthcare. So how many languages do you speak? Oh, I speak <laughs> about half of the 70 languages, Larry. Uh, uh, so I need interpreters for the other half. Um, no, I speak just enough Spanish and French to get in trouble uh, and uh, use an interpreter uh, when I can. So we rely a lot on bilingual staff, um, interpreters on site, and then we partner with Vanderbilt to use a, a video-based interpreter service as well in the exam. So do you need, do you need volunteers just to interpret? Uh, we do. We have a, volunteer, a robust volunteer medical interpreter program. Uh, there's a fair amount of training involved with it. Uh -huh. to kind of, it's not just walk in, hey, I, I can order at Las Palmas, um, let me help you. Um, uh, but uh, there, there's a, a difference, you know, in a professionalism and a code that you need to um, invoke. But uh, we do rely on, you know, it's staff driven now. Uh, I joined the team in 2000 helping it pivot from a volunteer-driven uh, ministry to a staff-driven and volunteer-supported. So there are three or 400 volunteers engaged in our work every year still, but now we have a staff of 65 uh, wow. in multiple sites. So. Wow. Um, how has your vision changed in the 20 or so years you've been at Siloam? And I'm specifically thinking you run a thing called Amplify Nashville. Is that, does that come out of Siloam? Yeah. And what is it, and how has all this affected you? Yeah. Well, I think over time, <clears throat> we began to realize that what we were experiencing every day, that sort of kingdom vision of, um, you know, an Egyptian um, uh, and a Guatemalan and a South Sudanese and a Iraqi-born Kurd, you know, all kind of connecting in the waiting room and then being seen, uh, and really breaking down stereotypes and barriers about different types of people. Uh, there's beauty and being rooted and having a community where you are known and there's a culture that's thick. I mean, Williamson County is kind of an epicenter of that. Um, and yet there's also this different beauty of sort of the pilgrim reality of being uprooted and being dependent on God in ways that are totally alien to those who, who know and have a rich, thick community around them. And Salome is one of those places where I, I say old Nashville meets new Nashville. Um, and that, that, that rooted community can meet the pilgrims coming in. We can be enriched by their experience and grow in our own faith uh, in the same way that they can be enriched and benefited by those who know the landscape, know the resources, know the, uh, the terrain, so to speak. Um, so um, we realized in 2016 um, that there was increasing talk about uh, foreigners, immigrants, you know, as sort of demonized groups that were here to, to steal our jobs or threaten us in some way. And that had not been our experience at all. I mean, we'd just seen the most incredible uh, character and, uh, and gratitude. You know, in many ways, the patients we were caring for from other countries were more grateful, more less uh, expectant, less uh, entitled to a handout uh, than maybe some who'd grown up here around us. And so we thought, you know, it's only a limited number of people who can come in and volunteer or be a student at Salome, but we created an event called Amplify Nashville to give a taste of that kingdom reality to the broader community. Um, 
And so uh, we started it at Oz Arts, and the whole intention was to lift up and celebrate uh, a few immigrants who have made a critical difference to our city and community, uh, as well as a bridge builder, somebody local who had contributed uh, and helped uh, build bridges to the newcomers that are coming. Uh, and so there have been a range of folks who've received those awards over the year, but it's a real uplifting. If you haven't been, I encourage you to come. Our next one will be this fall, um, uh, Amplify Nashville. Uh, you can just Google that. Uh, it'll come up. That, that spirit of amplifying what's good. Uh, you know, praise the good, see the good and praise it. You know, that, that kind of thing. I think you said you're the ninth generation Nashvillean. So you would have no idea growing up what it would be like to be a refugee. And I had the same experience, but up in New Jersey, I've been here long enough, so I, I feel a little bit of home now. But when we first came down, my wife felt like a refugee. Um, especially when we were told, this is honest truth, you damn Yankees better not make any trouble. We just as soon shoot you as talk to you down here. <laughs> oh yeah, welcome. <laughs> but I realized, I was amazed when I realized how much of the Bible is written by people who were refugees. Almost all of the prophets were refugees in Babylon or Assyria. And Jesus was a refugee. And Jesus was a refugee. And um, so it's, it's a matter of welcoming. I mean, people who are refugees have different experiences than you or I would have. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I married a Canadian was to sort of bust <laughs> up my own you know, worldview and broaden the gene pool a little bit. But um, I, I will say that, that that has been one of the great gifts and one of the great challenges of, of finding resources, helping you. Know, it's not... It's not an easy thing to develop a friendship or a patient relationship with somebody who's been utterly displaced and, yeah. and has a new set of needs that we can't imagine. But we have an amazing number of people who are not native to Nashville here, and that uh, I enjoy the rest the restaurants. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Yeah, that's that's a very you know s simple way to see it is just drive down Nolensville Road or Murfreesboro Road at yeah. this point. I will say that one of the neat volunteer opportunities we have now that we started around that time at, at Amplify Nashville is for small groups to, to partner with a new refugee family for the first six months of arrival here. Um, I see my friend Kenny Benj is here from Redeemer Anglican Church, uh, and I know he and other members of his church have formed small groups that have uh, accompanied a refugee family for that six months. and. And there's a simple curriculum, an interpreter we make available to, to help structure the process. Uh, there's practical benefits for their health, literacy, and navigating the transition. But really, it's about building friendships. And I, for those who've done it, they've told me it's been a life-changing experience. So if we were interested, we could talk to you or people at Siloam yeah. to do it. Yeah, SiloamHealth.org. There's a, a volunteer, how to get involved. That's one of the practical ways for those who don't have medical background or training. You took a sabbatical a couple of years ago and went up to Regent in Canada. Um, why did you do that, and how was that experience for both you and your family? Yeah, that was uh, 2009, 2010. Um, I, I will say that my wife and I had dreamed about maybe someday when we had kids uh, taking them with us um, to uproot and, and travel um, before they resented us for doing it. Um, so, you know, i.e. before, you know, uh, adolescence. You know, and uh, that opportunity presented itself with one of the, the medical students I had helped train approached us about coming to work with us and took over my practice. Um, and so I had been, I told you I became really a disciple of Christ in a, in a meaningful way after college and then hit medical school training and everything. So I had been squeezing in, you know, opportunities to grow and, and train myself in my faith, but I longed for more time and space to, to go deeper. Um, and so I took a few um, seminary extension classes through Christ Community and Scotty Smith um, at Covenant, Co uh, Covenant uh, Seminary um, at points along the way, and I, I built on that. And I was attracted to Regent College, which is in Canada, one, because uh, uh, my kids have dual citizenship. It was a chance for them to connect with their other motherland. Mm. Uh, but two, the ethos and the purpose of Regent was really designed not to produce uh, MDiv pastors of churches, but to, to educate the laity uh, in a deeper way. Uh, mm -hmm. So the founder was a geographer from Oxford, um, and, um, and, and historically, you know, 
there was always a, a flow of professionals coming through. So the dean of students was a physician when I went there, and the, the dean, academic dean was an economist, but who also had biblical studies training. And so that was attractive to me because I didn't want to leave the work, the meaningful work we were doing, but I wanted to go deeper mm -hmm. in the application of uh, the gospel to all of life. Did your kids enjoy being in Canada? Uh, they did. I mean, they didn't like, you know, kind of being away from their friends for a year, but quickly embraced it as kids do uh, and love. We, we, ca we camped uh, all the way across the country with a pop-up tent trailer uh, for about three weeks each way, and that created all kinds of memories, um, and they worked on their accents and, and, and deepened those <laughs> while they were there, but a, a very enriching time yeah. for them. And the whole time you and Heather have been married, Siloam has been sort of the third part of your, <laughs> the third person in your marriage. What do, what do you think it's going to be like in eight days? Uh, I don't know, Larry. Um, talk to me in, uh, in eight days. But, um, you know, having that experience before of taking 15 months off of practice and it was a good training for this. And, mm -hmm. and we, it was in many ways the hardest year of our lives too. It was, it was the richest and the hardest. That They often go together. Um, but uh, I, I found myself adapting to a new world as a student uh, and a father in a different country and trying to provide for my family and their emotional and social needs. And, and our marriage ended up thriving because of that. So I, I have confidence that um, um, God's going to give us what we need to transition um, in this next phase as well. Um, of course, I'm not leaving Salome in a deep sense. I'm going to stay engaged. I just really need probably to give some space, having been CEO for the past 10 years, to my successor to, to um, stretch their wings and, and, and establish their own priorities and then come alongside them in a way that would support the ministry uh, and also maybe give a clinical outlet for me and my students uh, at Belmont coming up. You're still looking for the successor, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Now, when you leave, you're going to the Thomas J. Frist Jr. School of Medicine. Did I get that all right? Thomas F. Thomas F. Frist, Frist Jr. School of Medicine at, Be at Belmont. Um, and I've heard some talks about what that is, and I find it very exciting. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is and why it is and what your vision is or their vision? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think Bob Fisher was the one who just left as president of Belmont about a year and a half ago, uh, who had been working on this idea for a long time. And of course, the big limiting factor for Belmont was they didn't have a hospital uh, on their campus like Vanderbilt or other typical uh, medical centers that grow up out of an academic medical system. Um, and so it took a partner to make that happen. And that's where Tommy Frist's name comes from because HCA, being based in Nashville is really the, the largest uh, hospital system in the world and has taken a leading role in medical education over the past decade. They train more medical residents now than any single institution in the United States. Um, and they had been slowly introducing residency programs at the TriStar Hospital, Centennial, Southern Hills, and others. And so it was it became a natural next progression to have medical students come alongside the residents. And so the timing was right from a partner standpoint. Of course, there's a, there's a shortage of healthcare providers nationwide, um, and it's just a very challenging, bureaucratically uh, uphill um, process to start a new medical school. And, um, and so when there's an opportunity, most institutions seize it, that they have a vision for it. And the vision for this particular school is not to replace the two excellent schools that we already have here in Vanderbilt, uh, and Meharry, uh, which have unique missions of their own, but really to kind of slide into a lane as Nashville's growing uh, to really be uh, a medical school of and for Middle Tennessee, uh, to train whole person healthcare providers who are getting interdisciplinary and intentional Christ-centered uh, formation opportunities to care for not just the organ system that is in front of you with a disease in it, uh, but the whole person, which is increasingly lost in the complexity and uh, and the, the power of our medical system and specialization these days, and ultimately to train practicing physicians. So uh, although we'll be exposing students to you know, the latest uh, research opportunities uh, to inform their practice, really the, the goal is to raise up uh, practicing physicians for the workforce and leaders who will take that entrepreneurial
entrepreneurial spirit uh, that Dr. Frist embodied uh, and be envisioning and thinking of new ways uh, to help improve whole person care uh, for their communities going forward. I think I mentioned that I heard is it Dr. Cornu mm -hmm. speaking uh, about his vision and what's making the Belmont School different in its whole person care. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that just a little bit? To Probably us? not as well as Dr. Cornu, <laughs> who's a, a bioethicist. He's actually also a physician who trained at Salome. Um, so I, I knew uh, Kimball uh, when he was a resident at Vanderbilt, but he went on to get a master's as well as a PhD in theology and to do a lot of work in bioethics at St. Louis University before coming and accepting a role as the, the provost professor in, uh, of bioethics for the uni whole university. Um, but in short, I think the big emphasis that, that Kimball would stress and that we are trying to inculcate into the curriculum and the approach is uh, raising uh, physicians of character, virtue, and ethics um, as a, as a backbone uh, for all the technical and, and cognitive uh, specialization that they're going to get, but, but beating that drumbeat that we, we must be formed uh, if we are to use and steward these gifts well. And they are, it's a gift to be trained and given the, the tools to practice modern medicine, but it is such a powerful gift and there's so many forces uh, steering you in different ways that are driven by profit and commercialization which in themselves aren't always wrong, but they have unintended consequences on the shape of physicians' practice and the approach to medicine. Um, and so it's really uh, anchoring the formative process. We'll accept students of all faiths or none. You know, I want to be really clear about that. But the, that Christ-centered uh, culture is, is the soil, which I think will allow for a real uh, flourishing of uh, these student uh, physicians. And it, it draws upon an example of what we've seen at Salome as a, a Christ-centered ministry that has had uh, all different types of volunteers of different faith backgrounds and students who are stunned to be given permission uh, to, to talk about different domains of the person's heart in an interview and build a relationship mm -hmm. and leave kind of open in a new way. Uh, I call it re-enchanting medicine, you know, to kind of what it we all wanted it to be and what we as patients often uh, long for uh, when we're being when we're vulnerable and we want to be cared for in a way that doesn't just move me through a system like a widget. Uh, it's interesting you said uh, any faith or none and I think this has been the history of Belmont of course it's a Baptist uh, origins but when my wife was going there we had two Belmont students living with us at our house one was Muslim and one was an Orthodox Jew. Mm -hmm. So it made for really interesting conversations around the dinner table. And we still stay in touch with Medhat and with um, the other one, with uh, Richard. Um, and a couple years ago, I went to, I ordered a course at Belmont that was taught by a friend of mine, it's, it's a Belmont uh, music program. And in essence, it was, you've been through the Belmont music business program. Now in this course, we're gonna tell you what a business is really like. And I sat there and for a whole semester with about 30 or 40 students and came away feeling, you know what, these kids are smart, they're enthusiastic, they're energetic, they love the Lord, they want to make a difference, the world's going to be okay, God's got it in, got it in control. But I want, <laughs> I just had to say all that, but I wanted to ask, what's your role going to be there specifically at the school? Yeah, well, really to do whatever the dean wants me to do. I tell. <laughs> Um, I've been talking to the leadership there for two years now since the idea was introduced and I've served on the advisory board and done some consulting work. Um, but the interim dean, Anderson Spickard III, um, who is a longtime educator and clinician at Vanderbilt, is my parents' physician. Um, I really know and respect Anderson well and I appreciate his invitation to come in at a time when they're in the accreditation process, their org chart is frozen. So uh, I don't. The, the, the ability to name new titles is, is a little tight until after the first phase. Um, but maybe in a week you'll hear a title that will come across. But I'll be an associate professor of medicine um, okay. and contributing to both the teaching and, and curriculum but also the administrative leadership um, of the school in different ways with an emphasis on mission integration. So that's my passion is, like you started off with, was creating a culture in an organization that reinforces and and, and manifest the, the core values on the wall so, uh, so that that mission won't be lost. Um, and I'm encouraged from Greg Jones as president of the university down uh, that they're really committed to that.
That's great. Is there anybody else that has a question for Morgan? Yes. Yes. Um, so Hal is referring to uh, Doug Mann, who is a Franklin area resident, long time um, rabble rouser and all around good guy, um, was a staff pastor with us for about a decade. And he also did some volunteering, was on staff at Belmont Church before that, and uh, certainly raised the bar in many ways. You know, we, we are always trying to do the whole person care as an individual, but the more you have a, a team where you can lean on when things get more complicated on a social work side, you can introduce your colleague more complicated on a spiritual side. And Doug was a master of kind of working across culture gaps to help people experience the love of Christ and even physical healing in their bodies. So uh, he, he made a great investment in our work and we're super grateful for him and others like him. Danny? You mentioned that you have various cultures from all over the world, which means you've got various religious backgrounds from all over the world. How do you, how do you make those, uh, cross those bridges and make those connections with people from a Buddhist, Hindu, whatever background they may be? Yeah. So the question is, how do you make connections and minister well uh, to people across religious difference as well as cultural difference? And I think if there's one thing I've learned over the years is that religion and spirituality is often a natural corollary or extension of culture, right? Um, they're not the same. You know, this is a very Southern and Christianized culture in, in Williamson County. Um, but you could also say that there's a difference between having a practice and being from the South and from Williamson County. And the same way goes for people from Egypt, um, who ironically, we, it's our second largest group of patients. And you might think, well, that, that'd be a Muslim people group. And yet 90% of Egyptians in Nashville are Coptic Orthodox Christians um, who have left Egypt because of persecution or limited opportunity seeking a, an opportunity here in this country. Um, so, but just because we share that, there's a whole lot we don't share. They, they fast more than our Muslim patients. Uh, it's just not in 40 concentrated days. It's spread out across the course of a year. So just even thinking about uh, how to take medicine, how to adjust diabetes regimens, how to uh, address all kinds of other decisions from family versus individual decision making. Who gets to know when you have cancer? Sometimes it's not you. Uh, sometimes it's just your family. Uh, and that's the proper way, the respectful way, the honoring way. So all these things are influenced by religious practice, and the bottom line is just being a learner. I mean, pretty quickly after I cared for one or two different people groups, I realized I'm not gonna be competent in, in any of uh, these cultures when you have so many. You might get competent in one other culture, maybe two, but 90, um, give me a break. So the, so the spirit of hum cultural humility has informed our practice, and that extends to that, that core virtue of hospitality. So if you think about hospitals emerged out of monasteries, you know, hundreds, hundreds, a thousand plus years ago, monastic communities opening the door to people without families, people who were strangers, who were visitors from other pilgrims from other countries and you're, who didn't have a family to care for them, and then using the best medical care that they had to care for them across cultural and religious difference. So that's really the root of the hospital, is this sacrament of hospitality. And we've really tried to lift that back up to the foreground. Uh, you may not associate your visit to the hospital with hospitality uh, <laughs> these days, but um, we, we really try and make that central. Um, so lots more we could say there, but uh, some of my most cherished relationships there. And even one relationship I brought here to New Canaan Society, maybe five years ago, I brought a friend, a Muslim friend I'd made uh, through Leadership Nashville, just to kind of highlight uh, how I was learning from meeting and knowing somebody from a different faith in a way that wasn't just trying to get them on my side, but really trying to, to learn. average stay of a patient in our practice or in Nashville? Okay. So I'll start with that one, um, easiest to address. So Salome is sort of like a medical foster home. 
we exist for those who have nowhere else to go. Um, and if you get insurance, we're excited and we're gonna help you try and use that and graduate you to a practice that will bill it. We um, raise funds to pay for most of the care that we deliver. We have some earned revenue streams, which help a lot. But because of that, uh, we really try to uh, minister to people for the season that they're in the most intense need. Um, so that may be a few months. Uh, we started a walk-in clinic out in Antioch uh, in the middle of the pandemic, and that has become a great gift to that community where people had no option to find an affordable way to get a walk-in without a pretty significant intake process that we have at our Melrose primary care practice. Uh, but some patients we've had for 20 plus years, um, and so it's everywhere in between. A lot of it depends on it, documentation status, you know, ability to access insurance. Uh, some will get insurance for a season but then lose it. So you may have seen this for yourself in your own businesses. Um, we have a very fractured healthcare payment system in this country, and, and that's one of the uh, political systemic challenges for having sustained care when you're living on a uh, lower income. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, so it's, I think there are two strands of our family, one on my mom's side and one on my father's side that are, I'm a ninth generation, maybe one's eighth, and it was all around 1800, um, either the McNary's or the Hardings um, arrived in the late 1790s, early 1800s. That was back when houses were a little cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Land was pretty cheap. Yeah. Uh, you just had to work it. Thank you very much. I'm my goal in this was to learn a little bit more about Morgan Wills, and I think I have, and I appreciate his Siloam, appreciate what he's done, and let's just close with a word of prayer. Our Lord, we thank you for the testimony and the example of Morgan and his family in Nashville, for what he's contributed to us and to the strangers and the immigrants and those who have come to be enrich our lives and our city's life. We just pray that you'll be with us today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you.